So Lee, welcome to Audible. Thank you so much for joining me. We're going to dive straight in to Hellbent. How would you describe this new book? I like that you're like, we're going straight to hell. (laughs) Uh, So Hellbent is really a journey to the underworld. I wanted to write something that would startle people and in some cases discomfort them uh, because I didn't want it to be a comfortable book. I think there are elements of it that uh, become almost cozy, but I also think there's quite a bit of urban fantasy or paranormal fantasy. And introduce me to Alex, the main character, Alex Stern. Alex Stern is a young woman who does not belong at Yale. Uh, That's where the story takes place. Uh, She has the ability to uh, see the dead. And so she's been drafted into uh, the ninth house that oversees the occult activities of the secret societies at Yale. Those societies are very real, although the uh, magic they practice in the book, I imagined. Uh, And it's Alex's job and her mentor's job and all of the members of the Ninth House to make sure that things don't get out of control. You put a lot of power into the hands of a bunch of college students, things could get dire very quickly. So that's her job, but she's ill-equipped to be at Yale. She is kind of the ultimate outsider. Uh, She comes from quite a difficult background and she's just trying to keep her head above water and get through. Yeah. And so how does it compare writing about a place that's real versus writing about a world that you've created like the Grisha verse? I wanted that uh, parody with reality to be there. To me, that raised the feeling of magic just being another kind of power in the same way that social influence or economic influences. The magic becomes more real because you know this city and all of the, the decoration, all of the buildings, all of these secret places are real. Mm. And so tell me about those secret societies. What is their purpose? What what do they do in, in the real world? Because for me, I'm like, a secret society, that in itself seems like something that is in fiction. I mean, look, <laughs> the societies at Yale are secret because way back when Phi Beta Kappa, which is now considered uh, just an academic society, Uh, It wasn't. It was also a social society. And then there was this major movement in the United States rejecting anything Masonic. It was considered elitist. It was considered dangerous. And so anything secretive or associated with those kinds of rituals, it was that was out. And so Phi Beta Kappa says, we're not secret anymore. And a bunch of guys at Yale were like, but we like being secret. (laughs) I was promised I was going to get to be secret. And so they founded Skull and Bones. And so the society Societies since then are essentially, they're networking clubs. And uh, they have evolved now to be places where you really do have the opportunity at their best to come into contact with people who, you know, after four years at school, you probably have closed in that social Mm -hmm. circle. And I got to meet people who I don't think I would have met otherwise. We had differing interests. We had differing majors. uh, And we got to know each other very well. And I'm still very close to the people who are in my society. But the reality is they occupy a very strange space on campus. There are eight societies that are considered the ancient eight. And they have these elaborate tombs that are essentially clubhouses. But they are massive, windowless buildings. They're built in these whimsical architectural styles. Skull and Bones is a giant Egyptian temple built in red stone on the campus. Uh, Book and Snake is a massive white marble mausoleum, okay? (laughs) Like, they want to be looked at, so they're essentially announcing their presence, and yet they said, you know, know, look at us, don't look at us, look at us, don't look at us, you know? So that, to me, that tension is very fun. And when I first started to understand what they were as a student, I just became obsessed with them. Mm. How did did you get in? (sighs) I had to do a few murders. (laughs) Um... (laughs) I don't honestly know. (laughs) So at least um, from my society, we had a rule where we had to look at literally everybody who was in the class beneath us. And uh, and I I guess I had done enough interesting things that somebody said, oh, I think she would be fun. I don't know. Maybe I met somebody at a party and they like me. And they take you and they interview you. And I remember they said, well, would you want to be in this? I said, well, I'm not going to say I love you first. You (laughs) You have to say you love me. And then I'll tell you if I love you. But um, yeah, I, I consider myself very fortunate because I got access to this world. But I also understand There's no question, and I think my relationship to the societies and to Yale is very much paralleled by Alex, in that Mm. I fell in love with this place. It was so different from 
any place I'd been before, it was it had a very deep magic to it. And I wanted so desperately to belong to it. But mm. you have to ask yourself in that desperation to belong what compromises you might be making. Mm. And before we depart from talking about Yale, what would you say is the most surprising thing in the book, which is actually drawn from a real experience you had at Yale? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I will say that people might be startled if they go down the rabbit hole. Many of the stories I tell about Yale and New Haven are 100 percent true. Mm. So when I talk about the fact that there are thousands of bodies still interred beneath the New Haven Green, that is true. And when I say that after a hurricane, a skeleton was found tangled in the roots of one of the trees having risen up through the soil, that is true. <laughs> so I, I invite people to, if you come across a little bit of New Haven lore or Yale lore, to, to, see, to find out, to give it a push and see if it's real. Mm -hmm. And what about people-wise? Do you know anyone like Walsh Whiteley? <laughs> <laughs> So he's a professor in the book. Uh, actually, much. yes. Professor Walsh Whiteley may seem very extreme to people, but in fact, um, the society that I was in was the last to accept women. And uh, in one of my early interactions with one of the alumni from the society, he turned to me and said, well, is there any hanky-panky at the hall? <laughs> and I tried so hard not to laugh at Hanky Panky and failed. But what I really thought was, do you think there wasn't before? Do you think there had to be women there for there to be Hanky Panky in the hall, sir? Uh, so I definitely met people like that. And there are definitely stories and people who, if not, who were maybe not direct parallels, but were certainly inspired by people I met. Mm. And how has it felt to kind of move from hanging out in kind of uh, early 19th century Russian kind of influences stuff to moving to America. How was that kind of felt in writing those different places? I think, I mean, I love research because it's really just learning stories and learning history. And for me, I think I've been moving closer and closer toward a particular kind of research. When I created the Grisha verse, I used uh, Tsarist Russia of the early 1800s and mid 1800s as a kind of cultural touchstone. That was a point of departure to build the world from and to start building these other cultures from. When I was working on Ninth House, I was really zeroing in on something specific that I wanted to adhere to as, as tightly as I could in terms of a time period and in terms of the environment there. And now now I'm working on my first historical fantasy, and that also, it's set in Renaissance Spain, and I am having to research very heavily. I've hired a research assistant for the first time because I'm definitely in deeper waters here, but I think all of that has been building toward mm. this moment where I feel, maybe I'm hesitant to say confident to write the work, but where I at least feel like um, I, I don't think this is a book I could have written as the first book in my career. Mm. And how did Shadow and Bone, that first book in your career, come about? Well, <laughs> I used to work in makeup and special effects, and I ended up uh, accidentally volunteering my services to someone for Halloween. And after being exhausted by this, um, and we were staying at their house in the mountains, and that was supposed to be the payoff for all this free work. Well, the night after Halloween, I stayed behind. Everybody went to dinner, and I stayed behind to read my book. I can't remember what book it was. And I fell asleep. And when I woke up, the room was pitch black. And I mean, not city dark. It was country dark where you mm. can't see your hand in front of your face. And I, of course, was sure that somebody had come to murder me because, as you know, serial killers <laughs> wait until you're awake to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I woke up and I was terrified and my heart was pounding in my chest. But uh, nobody, you know, attacked me. And so I went around the house turning on every light. And as I was getting ready for bed that night, I could not stop thinking about the fact that no matter how old we get or how wise we get, our fear of the dark never goes away. And I began to ask myself, all right, well, what if you couldn't turn the lights on? What if darkness was a place and the monsters you imagined there were real? and you had to fight them on their own territory. Why would you go into that territory? What would have created it? Uh, all kinds of questions kept presenting themselves. And that became the seed that would eventually become Shadow and Bone. Mm. And a lot of people will have discovered that and discovered your writing through um, the TV series. So Ninth House, that's gonna be a TV series too. How do you feel about 
that process second time round, maybe slightly different? It is a little different because I've actually been lucky enough to be involved in writing, writing the pilot. Um, I've been a little bit more hands on. We're at a different stage <laughs> with that. And, you know, the wheels of Hollywood do turn slow. But uh, for me, I definitely feel more comfortable. And the thing I've learned is that Adaptation is all about trusting your partners. Mm -hmm. And it is always a gamble. You might like somebody starting out, but you may not like them <laughs> a few weeks or a few months or a few years down the road. So you do your best. You you vet people, you try to trust your gut, you try to have conversations about the things that you are important uh, that are important to you, and then you move forward in good faith. Um, and there is a point where you have to let go. I was heavily involved in season one, and then I sort of took my hands off the wheel for season two because I needed to get back to writing books. Yeah. Yeah. This is my dream job. So I, <laughs> I need to keep doing it if I want to keep it. Yeah. And in all of the things you're working on, should you have time to pick up a book yourself and read? What what are the books or a book recently that has made you kind of, you know, want to get to the next page, want to get to the next chapter, you know, racing through it? I'm going to give you two. One is YA and one is adult. Uh, the YA is called That Self Same Metal. It is by Brittany Williams, and it is about a young woman who can forge magical weapons. Mm -hmm. And she works for, essentially for Shakespeare's players. It's a historical fantasy. And there's fae, and there's magic, and it's just, she's an actress herself and has done so much research into theater history, and it's fantastic. And then the other is a book that's not coming out for a while. It's called Long Live Evil which is just maybe the best title I've ever heard. <laughs> and it's by Sarah Reese Brennan. And Sarah herself um, ha had a fight with cancer. And this is a story about a young woman who is losing her fight with cancer. And she is given the opportunity to step into the fantasy world of the books she and her sister have been reading and potentially gain herself a new life. But what she discovers is... She thinks she's going to be one of the heroes of this book, but she's actually one of the villains. And it is such a funny, smart, satisfying story. It's about narrative and about the way women are viewed in narrative and what it means to be a villain and the things you can get away with if you happen to walk that line. And I thought it was just a delight and I cannot wait for it to be out because ever, I read an early draft mm. and ever since I read it, I've just been desperate to talk about it with someone. <laughs> it's so it's so different from anything else I've read. And, mm. and I think will be such a pleasure for people who are readers and lovers of fantasy, but have asked themselves some questions about it in the past. Mm, that's very exciting. Um, you mentioned the title there, so I do want to ask, is Hellbent your favourite title yet? And if not, what is? <laughs> I do love the title Hellbent because it has so many different meanings. <laughs> and I actually wondered if we would run into trouble if people would be like, we're not going to put that in the window. But it's been <laughs> fine. So, yeah, I for me, that's a fun one. And I absolutely love the cover. I know it creeps a lot of people out, but that delights me too. Yeah. Well, Lee, it's been such a pleasure to chat about it. Um, I love the book. Thank you so much. Thank you.